have already become familiar in the course of this conference with the manifold talents and activities of Shmuel Hugo Bergman along his life in Prague, in Palestine, <coughs> Jerusalem, in Eretz Israel. And it is fascinating to see how Bergman was willing and able until old age to teach and write and to keep alive um, intellectual and cultural networks. Typical for Bergman's life before and after settling to Palestine, Israel, was also that he continued to be a, could say, cross-border intellectual a philosopher, deeply religious, but a politically thinking mind at the same time. <coughs> How did Bergman deal with the Jewish thoughts, for example, on redemption and renewal and in a more and more changing Yeshuv in Palestine? How did he act in face of the persistence of Israeli-Palestinian violence, the wars with the neighbors, and the growing cultural rifts across Israeli society? Was the visionary academic from Prague enabled to harmonize his thoughts about justice, human rights, equality, and early Zionist dreams with the real experiences on site? No doubt, Bergman was electrified when the state of Israel took shape, witnessing an important fulfillment of the Zionist dream in 1948. At the same time, and while, while staying close with the founding fathers of the state, Bergman felt and raised concerns in face of the escalating conflicts between Jews and Arabs already in the 1930s and 1940s. That means in the last decades in the pre-state <coughs> period. As the long-term head of the Jewish National Library in Jerusalem and then up from 1935 as the rector of the Hebrew University, Bergman was not only a key figure in the academic life, but also a man who realized the extreme dynamics of modernization in Arab Israel the land of the forefathers, but also a land where other people have been at home for a long time as well. He was feeling that the rapid development of a Jewish state while ignoring the interests of the Arab population in the country before <coughs> 1948, as we know the overwhelming ethno-cultural majority, could easily lead to uncontrollable conflicts. Thus, Hugo Bergman and befriended friends, befriended scholars, decided for starting a unique initiative, the Brit Shalom. Brit Shalom was close to the Hebrew University and its intellectual surrounding and networks, but was also close to intersections of academic life and civil society. The central aim of Brit Shalom was to build a peaceful coexistence far away from a purely Jewish nation state only for Jews. <coughs> feeling themselves in the footsteps of Achat Haram and other uh, masterminds, which alone supported the establishment, as we know, of a binational state where Jews and Arabs would have equal rights. Interestingly, the protagonists of the Bridge Alum were in favor for a very close cooperation, if not even conflation of local, regional, and supra-regional bodies <coughs> supported by Jewish and Arab sides equally. Co-founders of Brit Shalom, as we know, have been beside uh, Bergman, uh, people like Gershom Scholem, Martin Buber, Arthur Rupin, Hans Cohen, Ernst Simon, Felix Welch, Robert Welch, Chaim Margulis, Kalvariski, and Yaakov Jonathan. The Jewish protagonists went so far to think about joint Jewish-Arab political parties and bodies, joint chambers of commerce in Haifa and Jaffa, joint clinics, joint trade unions, joint schools, and so on. <coughs> At the same time, and this is important to note, national Jewish self-determination in the land of Israel shouldn't be given up. <laughs> if one reads today from our perspective the original programmatic points by the Brit Shalom, it sounds really Courageous. And so it belongs to the tragic sides of for the Bridge Shalom that its protagonists have been well respected public figures and academics but could not find sub substantial support. Bergman, Scholem, Welch, and their peers did not find comparable partners also on the Arab side, 
at least not committed in a similar way developing ideas for a joint world for tomorrow. In fact, Bridge Shalom tried to get in touch with people like Musa Kasim Pasha, the then president of the Arab Executive and the Nashashipi Family Association, and both seemed to have a certain willingness in that time for cooperation or even negotiation, for example, on the size of Jewish immigration. There were some talks, of course. However, no substantial results came out. Bridge Shalom failed its mission underwent a stage of dis disintegration and finally dissolved in the early 1930s. Some of the co-founders, like the highly controversial Arthur Rupin, even turned early away from the Brit uh, Shalom after traumatic incidents, like the bloody anti-Jewish massacre in Hefron in 1929. Of course, the question remained whether the initiative miscarried due to complicated times and complicated uh, circumstances or because of its unrealistic and utopian program. And indeed, uh, we could say the self-expectations were very high. Bergman brought a certain religious sense in, inspired, for example, by Martin Buber's thoughts and thinking about Jewish renewal and discussing whether the origins of the Jewish people in the Middle East ought to be a specific point of the dialogue with the Arabs. Bergman raised this question in the journal Iyun while his friends were discussing whether the Zionist movement might take over a certain role in the Eastern world in reawakening the Oriental people. And Bergman thought that the rift between East and West, obviously caused by the domination of the East by the Western imperial forces, could be healed by the Jewish people when he wrote, quote Bergman, for this world historical mission, Europe has at its disposal a mediating people that has acquired all the wisdom and skills of the Occident without losing <coughs> its Oriental character. A people called to link Orient and Occident in fruitful reciprocity, just as it is called to link East and West in the new teaching. Anyway, what made Bergman so extremely optimistic for the future of Palestine, Israel and the whole region? In his works, Bergman was strongly inspired, also strongly inspired and influenced by the thoughts of Aaron David Gordon, one of the most important spiritual minds behind practical Zionism and labor Zionism in the issue. Deeply influenced by such thinkers like Lev Tolstoy, Gordon combined ideas of religion and labor work in the promised land. But what remained from such ideal conceptions just a few decades later? In Faith and Reason, published in 1961, Hugo Bergman asked, did the new Jewish nationalism <coughs> possess the moral and cosmic qualities which Gordon demanded? He saw the crucial test in the attitude of the Jews towards the Arabs. His attitude towards the Arabs was informed by the injunction of the Bible concerning the stranger that sojourns in their midst. Our relations to the Arabs must rest on cosmic foundations. Our attitude toward them must be one of humanity, of moral courage, which, which remains in the highest plane, even if the behavior of the other side is not at all that just desired. Indeed, their hostility is all the more reason for our humanity. Interestingly, Bergman kept on partly religious intended visions for a better order of values in society and in the world as a rule. And Bergman also continued to come back to developments on early Zionist visions and dreams of social justice and modernization. Thus, in a letter to the members of Kibbutz Krefzibach, which had been founded in 1922 by a group of Czechoslovak and German Jews from the Blue-White Blue Youth Movement, he tried to make a kind resume of the movement itself, 50 years after foundation itself, and future of the State of Israel. In his letter to the friends in Krefzibach, written on September the 14th in 1972, Bergman is raising very serious questions and obviously missing substantial answers. So he writes, 
Is the spirit of the fathers still alive in this youth? The problems of today seem to be others, deeper ones, more decisive ones. We are on the ground of life. Are we able to live in a Jewish world surrounded by enemies? Are we able to live there? Are we able to sit on bayonets here? I don't know any answer. Already in the years before, Hugo Bergman seemed proud on what the Jewish state and Israeli society had achieved on the one hand and on reflecting what dreams and wishes had failed and made things even more complicated. Thus, in September 13th, in 1962, Bergman wrote in his diary, This afternoon a PhD student was attending me and I have read to him from my Palestine diary of 1910. Regrettably, the blimpish attitude of the settlers, and here he means the socialist, uh, visionary socialist settlers in early Palestine, the blimpish attitude of the settlers towards the Arabs, the Arab fellas, have been obvious. Is it still possible, he asked, is it still possible to develop something good and proficient by a state that is built on such a base? This is a real big problem. But it seems also that Hugo Werfmann turned his opinion about feasibility of an extensive peace with the Palestinian Arabs when reflecting on the specific circumstances and driving factors in this tragic ongoing conflict. Already in 1956, Bergman wrote in a letter to Paul Amman, till 1933, peace would have been possible with the Arabs. Afterwards, the pressure of Jewish immigration was too big. And no Jewish peace activist could resist this pressure. And the Arabs, except being angels, could not agree. So in fact, both sides were right. We also know and could uh, extend uh, to that fact that Hugo Bergman, until his old age, was also searching for ways out of special dilemmata by looking for esotericism or alternative spirituality. But we had it already in Boa's presentation and we will have it in Shimon's in the next session as well. Thank you. Oh, I don't like you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Boa. And uh, I am here to just to share a few additional remarks or uh, observ observations. Uh, being a cultural anthropologist uh, by training, I'm uh, predictably highly interested uh, how such uh, significant ideas uh, that we just heard have evolved and uh, mutated uh, within a time and whether they somehow resonate in the contemporary discourse. About Bergman talk on Arab, we learned, uh, except for uh, Bergman diaries and his famous essay, also from many other sources, among others, uh, Dmitry Shumsky or Martin Wein. Uh, so it was already in 1911 when Bergman in Prague opened a debate on Jewish-Arab relations in Palestine. And he was also one of the first who started to compare the conditions in the Middle East with Czech-German relations in Europe. In brief, for Bergman, the national conflict in Bohemia and Moravia was mirroring the situation in Palestine and Israel. Just for curiosity, because the Czech-Czechoslovak internal struggles in the 20th century may be less known for our international audience, I would like to quickly illustrate how Bergman's thoughts may have evolved with the time and have been crucial for Czechoslovak-Israeli and Czech-Israeli interactions till nowadays. For example, in June 1967, one of the main topics during the Czechoslovak Writers' Convention was a protest against the severance of diplomatic relations between Czechoslovakia and Israel following the Six-Day War. Czech writer Pavel Kohout, a reform communist of Christian background, gave the following speech. It 
In a certain part of the world, a state structure emerged. It emerged on the historical territory of a small nation which was oppressed and forcibly assimilated by its neighbors for centuries. It emerged as a consequence of a worldwide military conflict on which this nation, although small, played a considerable role and received fixed borders and was recognized diplomatically. Yet it did not stop being a thorn in the eye of its neighbors, who started to reclaim its territory after some time. The excuse for escalation was especially the fact that in the new state a strong minority of the neighboring nation remained the rights of which were supposedly oppressed. After 20 years, things got so much out of hand that the powerful neighbor threatened the small country with annihilation, not just metaphorically, but factual, and not just privately, but before the eyes of the entire world. It remains to be added for completeness, say, that the small state was a pro-Western-oriented bourgeois democracy, while its strong neighbor had a totalitarian regime installed which covered up its expansive nationalism with pseudo-socialist traits. The attempts of the small country to reconstitute order on its territory and to liquidate terrorists were called genocide by the strong neighbor and were used as an excuse for ultimate demands. Either you capitulate by a certain date or you will be crushed on the day. So far history. You surely noticed that this was really history. However, I did not talk about the Arab versus Israeli duel, but about Germany versus Czechoslovakia. Kohout also directly compared the Six Day War to the 1938 Munich Agreement. If Czechoslovakia would have fired the first shot in 1938 instead of surrounding, would one of the rightful judges of that incident label them as the aggressor? in the moral sense, barely so. It reminds to add that Bergman originally did not identify the Zionists with the Czechs, but with German-speaking Jews in the Czech lands, such as himself. Here we could also discuss Kafka's short story, Jekylls and Arabs, that, that was also interpreted in many contradicting ways, attributing different roles to the mentioned protagonists, Jews, Arabs, Czechs, and Germans as we know uh, already from uh, mentioned metricians. Drawing similar and slightly different analogies and comparisons among Czech Jews and Czech Israelis, either based on shared nostalgia, either being pragmatically instrumentalized, have become common also for Czech-Israeli relations and political discourses after the Velvet Revolution, 1989. One more highly present day example from the beginning of 2021. On the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the renewal of diplomatic relations between the Czech Republic and Israel, the Embassy of the State of Israel, together with the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs, launched an exhibition titled Mysterious Bond that was introduced in the following manner. Exhibition visualizes the mysterious and deep bond that was existed between the Czech and the Jewish nation for centuries. The embassy of the State of Israel invited Czech spectators with the similar words. The bond which is mysterious and deep is not arising from a calculation, a quid pro quo, but it is reaching back to the very onset. And the exhibition was followed by the book on the same title, of the same title, uh, where the Czech Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tomáš Petříček, at that time expressed his conviction that the exhibition and the book shed a light on the unique Czech-Israeli bond, which is mysterious yet at the same time perfectly natural. So perhaps also certain lines of Czech-Israeli official exchanges nowadays could be traced back to Bergman and his fellows. To conclude, I would like to mention that with my colleagues, Dr. Olaf Lochner and Professor Joanna Biduch, we just finished an anthropological research article on evolving situation of Jewish-Muslim-Arab relations in Europe and in the Middle East. And it was very interesting for us to observe how some of Bergman thoughts are being materialized or perhaps unconsciously reflected within the ongoing discourses and peace-building initiatives in the turbulently emerging New Middle East after signing Abrahamic Accords last year. It is needless to emphasize that contemporary Hugo Bergman would nowadays be probably quickly labeled as a peace-building activist 
and his promising academic career would be at stake.